Have the girl, John. Easy, Dutch. She's a parting gift from me. Over two fucking years ago, I made a top 10 video chronicling my favorite gaming protagonists. Everybody loves a good hero, someone they can believe in and root for, but me personally, I'm almost always more interested in the opposite perspective. Video games have no shortage of no good motherfuckers, so this one goes out to all the bad boys and girls out there. It's time to break down my top 10 video game antagonists. America's wanted this war for years. The Patriots, they knew war was good for the economy. Four years later, their legacy lingers on. The memes. Despite the fact that this entire list could easily be filled with nothing but Metal Gear villains, I'm gonna try to keep my fanboyism to a minimum. The first of two Metal Gear entries on this list is none other than the public servant of sadism, the politician of pain, Senator Armstrong. <laughs> Idiot. You only see Armstrong in the flesh one time before your climactic duel with him at the end of Metal Gear Rising, if I remember correctly, but the scene certainly makes an impact because the topic of conversation is euthanizing homeless children. You could not fucking construct a more evil trio of words. Now, I'm going to be tempted to make a Trump joke this whole time, but I'm going to restrain myself and just let Armstrong do the talking for me. Let's take a look at some of this crazy candidate's most memorable moments. <laughs> Played college ball, you know. That's a cushy Ivy League school. <laughs> Try University of Texas. <laughs> the weak will be purged, and the strongest will thrive. Free to live as they see fit. They'll make America great again! Did he just... They'll make America great again! When, when is this? What the hell are you talking about? Boy, that is extremely distressing. President Armstrong is the final obstacle Raiden must surmount in the bug nuts, batshit insane spin-off that is Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. And he is an appropriately daunting foe, which is surprising seeing as the game begins with our protagonist basically sword fucking a skyscraper. That's all fine and dandy, but what you don't get out of your average giant robot tutorial boss fight is a dash of personality. Something I think we can all agree that this guy has in spades. Armstrong's got the style, but he's also got the substance. Let's take a listen. I have a dream. What? That one day, every person in this nation will control their own destiny. A land of the truly free, damn it. Where power and justice are back where they belong. In the hands of the people! Ah. Yeah. Now before you say, hey, sounds like a... So like maybe he's got a point. Just remember that this is the same guy who kidnapped hobo kids and literally scooped their brains out. Put them in jars. Look at all those fucking dead homeless children. God, what is this, Blood Diner? Why are you watching this video? Go watch Blood Diner. Enough. Emperor Deviculus is the most metal thing in Brutal Legend, which is really saying something in a game starring Lemmy Kilmeister and Ozzy Osbourne as the fucking upgrade merchant. Well, it's about fucking time. We all know Tim Curry has a voice for the ages, and he bestows upon Deviculus pipes that he just can't help but fall in love with. He's got a voice like a butter bath, smooth and creamy. I uh, typed the words butter bath into the YouTube search bar and this came up. So I guess we can... Uh, we can watch this for a minute. I can't! <laughs> uh, oh my god, it's so gross. Oh, I bet that stuff touches your butthole. <laughs> On top of a truly fucking killer design, Curry gives the character his all and turns him into an appropriately smarmy motherfucker of a demon lord. Man, man, how's Tim Curry doing these days? Oh, oh god, fuck, no. Oh, just no, switch it, switch it, switch it, switch to the... Oh, ah. Oh. Ah, that's a bit better. There are villains you love. There are villains you love to hate, and to hate to love. But there are also villains that you just straight up fucking hate. And there's nothing easier to hate than a Nazi. Frau Engel is just about as shitty as they come. I could sit here all day and list off her bad qualities, but it'd be easier to just list off her good qualities, which are nothing. She's just a 
fucking disgusting monster of a person, and there are few cutscenes this generation more satisfying than when BJ slams that fucking hatchet into her dome. Frau Engel is also one of the only characters since Vas Montenegro to nail the first person monologues without making them annoying as all fuck. I don't know who thought it was a good idea to make the villain of Far Cry 5 the most unenthusiastic televangelist the world has ever seen, but Frau Engel is how you do that shit right. Oh, uh, 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 make it stop. Make it stop. Turn it off. The Last of Us is fraught with tension. Every moment you spend with Joel and Ellie inevitably clenches your butthole harder than a whole week's worth of Kegels. But that tension doesn't reach a fever pitch until the final big act of the game, winter. The winter portion of The Last of Us is one of the most intense segments in any fucking video game ever, and that is almost entirely due to Nolan North's petrifying performance as Cannibal Ned Flanders. Nolan North brings an unexpectedly chilling calm to David, something that initially makes the player feel comfortable. You immediately assume, based on your previous experiences with the game, that David is going to be your companion for this act, much like Tess or Sam and Henry, but then he tries to eat your ass in more ways than one, might I add. This mechanical trick that Naughty Dog pulls with David is brilliant. The way they lure you in with his seemingly trustworthy demeanor is really well executed and really Really uncomfortable. You just don't know what this deranged motherfucker is gonna diddly deadly do next. And despite his limited screen time before he cops a machete to the face, he's easily Naughty Dog's most fascinating villain to date. Yada yada yada, Joker didn't originate in games. Blah blah, not a real video game villain. My list! Zip it! Few actors can claim to have filled the big floppy shoes of such an iconic role, and even fewer can claim that they've made an indelible mark on the character itself. There's a reason that countless fans immediately associate the Joker with Mark Hamill. His rendition of this character is a high watermark not only for Batman, but for animated voice acting as a whole. The man has Arkham in his fucking name! He was destined to play this crazy clown! 20 years into the role, and the character is just as full of life as he was in the animated series, even when He's fucking dead! Ah! Hamill's Joker carries an undeniable charisma in every iteration of the character he's played, and that entertainment factor carried over beautifully into Arkham Asylum, an experience that cemented Joker as an all-timer in terms of video game villains. But one home run clearly wasn't enough for WB, ruiner of all things good and pure in the world, because over the next few years we received not one, not two, but three more fucking games! featuring Joker as the central antagonist. It's weird to think about, but despite the Joker not strictly being a video game character, he is featured in more video games than any other character on this list. Despite his blatant overexposure, you just can't deny the pure brilliance of Mark Hamill's performance across the Arkham series. And big ups to Troy Baker as well for nailing the impression. Joker is one of the greats. We can never forget that. Even if we do all constantly try to forget that time he injected himself with a bunch of Titan and turned into what do you call this, Juicin' J? Juicy J? Isn't that a rapper? Many characters on this list help exhibit just how important good acting is to creating a compelling villain, but I feel like none of them showcase this better than Far Cry's own Bas Montenegro. No, 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 please. This time is gonna be different. I'm sorry. I don't like the way you are looking at me. Yes, Voss isn't the most original of antagonists, I kept expecting Jungle Joker to tell me where he got those scars, but Michael Mondo's terrifying performance more than sells the character. He's so entertaining that I found myself rushing through the campaign just to spend more time with him, but honestly, less is Moss with Voss. I never finished the campaign of Far Cry 3, that was the cost of the loss of Voss before the final boss. What is happening to my sentences right now? It seems like the developers just didn't know what they had on their hands, I bet someone out there... Uh, 
there. Who who wrote this game? I bet Jeffrey Yohlam wakes up every morning in a cold sweat and thinks to himself, Oh god damn, why'd I kill that guy? What on earth compelled me to make that horrible decision? Ever since Voss, Ubisoft has been desperately trying to replicate what made that character so compelling, going as far as to literally kidnap you from the fun parts of the game to take you to Jesus camp! Man, at the time I thought Pagan Men was bad, but at least that motherfucker didn't slobber all over himself like a goddamn baby! At this point, I am fully expecting Far Cry 6 to be a $60 monologue that you put in your console and it just plays itself for 20 fucking hours! <laughs> One of the keys to a good villain is crafting a character that believes they are the hero of their own story. And few villains personify this idea quite like the architect of Rapture herself. Anne Andrew Ryan is who it was. Ah yes, the man who can monologue like no other. If a well-tailored suit could speak, it would sound like Andrew Ryan. Despite the fact that we really only see this guy for about five minutes before we bash his fucking brains in, Andrew Ryan is one of the most philosophically enthralling antagonists ever crafted, and he is no doubt the peak of the enemy on a loudspeaker trope. Much like Shodan from the original System Shock, Ryan spends a large majority of the game just being a dick to you, and I personally can't get enough of that shit. He lived stylishly, and after giving one of the greatest monologues in video game history, he died stylishly. In the tradition of all rich white men from the 1950s, he was beaten to death by his own prized golf clubs. You know, I... I never noticed he used a putter in this scene. Something about that makes this feel... Less dignified, I feel. Like, look at this little dinky thing. If he were using, like, a three iron or a driver or something that really cuts through the fairway, it would have made a bit more sense, had a bit more impact. Yeah, I played golf when I was, like, nine, fun fact. People always said I had a good swing, and that was only because I played the Tiger Woods games, and literally... It just literally copied what was on the screen. Super easy sport. Coming in at number three, he's big, he's green, he's potentially a sexual predator, he's everybody's favorite hat wearing, tail wagging, wife stealing lizard monster. Give it up for Bowser! Now, to be clear, if this list were measured by competence, successful villainy, and shit, Bowser wouldn't even crack the top ten. He is a fuck up. But what makes Bowser so enduring is, well, that he endures. This motherfucker is easily the most persistent villain in video game history. You can't stop this fucking guy. Every other week, he's cooking up some new crazy ass scheme to take over anything ranging from a vacation island to the fucking universe. And for some reason, all of these plans always gotta involve Mario's wife. This giant spiked back have an amphibian fuck holds a sickening, decades deep obsession with Princess Peach. And he spends his days and nights trying to take that poor woman to Mushroom Tip Kingdom. He's got a bunch of kids. And like, where did he get these kids? That question will lead you down some sickening rabbit holes, I'll tell you that much. Where did Bowser get his kids is not something you want in your search history. I am for sure on a watch list right now. Bowser is a villain's villain. He's pure, he's simple, he's got an unforgettable silhouette, and he just won't quit. See you next week, you lovable evil bastard. Ready to go, Snake? Number two on our list is the inevitable second Metal Gear-centric entry in this top ten, and it just had to be my main man, Revolver Ocelot. Ocelot, aka Shalasaska, Shala Salashaska, Shala Shakalaka Ding Dong, aka Adamska, aka Adam. My friends call me Adam. This 19th century themed super spy is always there always in the shadows, planning his next crazy ass move and or outfit. He's gone through so many iterations, we've seen so many different sides of this cowboy coin that it would be impossible to leave this iconic motherfucker off the list. We've seen him as a young twink, a uh, middle-aged Troy Baker, an old man with a hand, uh, an old man without a hand, and an old man with somebody else's hand. Don't make me explain that shit, please. Whether he's traipsing through the jungles of Soviet Russia or just hanging out in the sunshine of the Seychelles, this complex little cowboy is consistently one of the most compelling, dynamic, and batshit insane characters in all of video games. Wow. I've never heard someone say, I'm a bottom, 
with just a noise. Truly, the homoerotic respect erection he maintains for Big Boss and his kin throughout the series is a legendary. You could cut that sexual tension with a high frequency blade. Ocelot is a mystery of a man, and that's what makes him so engaging. You never know what he's gonna do next. Sometimes you love him, sometimes you hate him, and sometimes you feel something weird in your pants in between. Rock on, Revolver. <laughs> to be injected with praying mantis DNA, I've got some good news and some bad news. Bad news is we're postponing those tests indefinitely. Good news is we've got a much better test for you, fighting an army of mantis men. Pick up a rifle and follow the yellow line. You'll know when the test starts. My friend Jacob once described Portal 2 as a three-way battle between writers trying to write the best character ever and it ended in a tie. While I can't disagree with that statement whatsoever, there's only one true MVP of the Portal series, and that's GLaDOS. Oh, it's you. GLaDOS is a nearly omnipotent machine of truly menacing proportions, and yet that menace is quickly overshadowed by the fact that she immediately comes off as, well, just as a total bitch. I don't like to use that word when talking about women, but A, GLaDOS is not a woman, she is a giant killer robot, and B, if there's any video game character in existence deserving of the title of full-on stone-cold bitch, it's GLaDOS. She's constantly saying stuff just to be mean, persistently berating the player until they become a shell of their former selves. Do you, do you see what I did there? <laughs> I'm such a humorist. Pretty much everything she says in both games is simply there to take the player on a one-way trip to put downtown. But GLaDOS's massive ego does stem from something concrete, as she's just about the peak of scientific perfection. She can do whatever the fuck she wants in this facility. This is her world. GLaDOS is so full of herself because seemingly, she is the perfect asshole. And along with being the perfect asshole, she's pretty much the perfect villain because you can never get enough of her. The designers at Valve are masters of giving you exactly what you want while at the same time leaving you begging for more like a crackhead in a crack den with no money for crack. I don't fucking know. Much like Half-Life, leaving us wanting more is exactly what both Portal games did, but with an ending this time which is always nice. Any game that can turn its villain into a fucking potato and still have her maintain a commanding presence is worthy of any top 10 villains list. GLaDOS is hilarious. Charming, intimidating, mercilessly cutting, and to top it all off, she's got a great singing voice. This was a triumph. I'm making a note here. Huge success. It's hard to overstate my satisfaction. Aperture science. We do what we must because we can. For the good of all of us, except the ones who are dead. But there's no sense crying over every mistake. You just keep on.